An empowered woman is a woman who is deeply in touch with her soul. I see women as really, this is their time, and I think the women are coming on strong. To be there in your power, but also in your sincerity. The only way to be truly alive and to be truly empowered and to be truly healthy is to be acting from that thing that is always calling you, to be coming from that place of inspiration. There's nothing wrong with being a strong leader, a good speaker, and being female. Women who have children are extraordinary. Hiring a woman with children is a great thing to do because she's going to be your sharpest employee. There are so many women out there that have great stuff to offer, they're just not saying it loud enough. Women could be anything they wanted to be. Often we race down one path in an attempt to achieve a life filled with our ideas about success. Without a roadmap, many of us never fulfill our dreams. Empower the movie brings together a compelling group of empowered women to guide each of us on achieving our goals and dreams. Empower doesn't provide us with a magic formula. It will, however, return each of us to the basic key elements that are needed to live a life filled with balance, joy, and power. Once we are aware of these key elements and the core element, we are able to accelerate our journey. It's no longer a journey that you need to take alone. If one of us is left behind, we are all left behind. If you're ready to push beyond your limitations and join with the women of the world, let's begin. Many women want to make a major impact in their lives, families, and communities, and yet, at the same time, have a disempowering belief that they don't deserve to be financially abundant, or that they shouldn't receive financial rewards for contributing. When each of us embrace the key element of financial prosperity, our lives, families, and communities benefit from this prosperity. There are really two kinds of financial wealth. There's a financial wealth that's gathered by people who are living in fear. And that's not actually abundance. I know a lot of people who have a lot of money, but they're living in fear and they're slaves to that money. True wealth, true abundance comes from an inner state first, from a state that has a, a sense of peace, well-being, inner abundance, and from that the outer world shows a reflection of abundance. And that comes with a sense of freedom. That comes with a sense of fullness. And that comes with a sense of, I am enough and I have enough. A recession is a state of the mind. And that what you put your attention on grows stronger in your life. And to the extent that you're clear, what you choose to have show up in your life will, and only to the extent that you're clear. So if, if you're a powerful being, and we all are, every single person, I don't care who it is, is powerful. You're just using your power to either attract what you choose to create in your life, or you're using your power to attract exactly what you don't want to have happen to happen. So many women feel subtly or obviously disempowered about money, feeling that either uh, math is not my strength or that money is somehow boring or that even though I know better it's for men or that it will be um, hard or difficult and all of those ideas are really uh, limiting and they're simply not true. If you really love what you're doing it doesn't show up as work. So from the outside looking in somebody could say wow you work really hard you work a lot of hours you're putting in a lot of nights and weekends and if you talk to me and say, well, what is it that you're doing on a Saturday afternoon at three in the afternoon? It's like, I'm having a great time. I'm being really creative and productive and I'm you know, producing results. And for me, it doesn't show up as work. When I think about what really creates uh, an empowered woman, I'm very convinced that having a healthy relationship to our experience of money is essential. Being a financially empowered woman, you know, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be rich and there's nothing wrong with being rich. I have found that the women who stay vested and aware of their financial future 
do far better and don't sabotage themselves than the women who turn over their finances to somebody else and say, here, you take care of this for me. I know a lot of women out there, they're trying their best to save the world and they feel like for some reason they shouldn't need money to do this. Whereas in my experience, I feel like the more money you have, the easier it's going to be to contribute. Well, I think financial health is being okay with what you've got and being happy with what you've been given and what you've been able to create and never comparing yourself with other people. Because I think people assume that, that those who make lots and lots of money are happy. And I can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist in Los Angeles and I work a lot with people in the entertainment industry who have lots and lots of money. And that does not guarantee any kind of happiness. I've had people come to me who have everything on the outside and they've lost themselves. They haven't connected with their own inner self um, to know how to enjoy all of it. True abundance comes from a state of inner wealth. There are a lot of people though who have amassed a lot of money they are not truly abundant if they've done it and they're living in a state of fear. When women feel like they can integrate, and it's not balance, it's integrate, feminine qualities of wealth and masculine qualities of wealth, what they discover is their authentic way to be prosperous and happy and peaceful and creative. The feminine qualities of wealth are love, faith, satisfaction, fullness, receptivity. Now the masculine qualities of wealth are the qualities of creativity, of generosity, of giving, of wisdom, of power, of focus, of direction. Those masculine qualities, when they're present, there's a sense of leadership, there's a sense of uh, being able to generate and provide, and there's a sense of financial direction and fulfillment that's very important. Financial abundance can come from a smaller amount of money too. It's not how much money you have, but your relationship to the money that you have. Because when a woman knows that she can choose to generate income, to monitor her investments, or to educate herself financially, it's very attractive to clients and to partners and to children and to the world, and it's very valuable. The place where I see a lot of people fall down is that they're totally focused on the bottom line. I need to make X amount of dollars every month and have to hit these numbers by the end of the year. And everything's all about the numbers. And there's no heart or soul there. It's not about why am I doing what am I doing? How am I contributing to the planet? You know, what are the people who work with me? What's the experience they're having? It's just all about earning money. So I think from what I've been able to experience for myself and for my friends, if you can combine you know, passion with a desire to contribute something on some level, the money will show up eventually. So failure gives us an opportunity to learn how to build our muscle of forgiveness and getting into the present moment. I ended up removing the emotion from the financial piece of it. And I stopped judging myself about what I did or didn't do wrong because I beat myself up for years. I should have done this, I should have I should have invested here, I shouldn't have spent this money, and I let go of it, you know? And as soon as I did that is when my business started shifting. When we look at moving past the money mistakes that we've made, the element of celebrating what we did learn is really powerful. So if I can't take care of myself financially, how can I take care of anybody else? And then a lot of it has to do with what we believe. As you can now see, attaining the financial prosperity key element allows you the ability to contribute more to your family, your community, and to yourself. Our next key element is the relationships and community key element. When we begin to explore this key, our joy expands profoundly and our lives become easier because now we have the help of a team and we're not just on our own. Relationships and community are vital for living an empowered life. We are not here on this planet alone by design. I mean, we are really here to learn and grow through our relationships and through our community. I think a lot of women still think it's men versus women or women versus men. I think we got that from preschool and we never somehow grew out of it. But really we're all here to work together. I think men are great and I think women are great and I see amazing contributions from both sides of that. In fact, you are making this movie for your daughters so that they will grow up in a world where women are empowered and that makes the world better for all of us. 
So there's ways of being that I think have me in this particular generation feeling a sense of connectedness to the women who came before, to the women who fought battles that were much more dramatic and serious than the ones that, that I have faced. One of my very favorite quotes that shows how important each one of us is for creating a world of peace is a Chinese proverb that I'd love to share. It goes like this. When there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. When there is beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. When there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. And when there is order in the nation, there will be peace in this world. When we each feel the light in our own souls, when we wake up to our true power, then we will help create peace here on this planet of ours. And that's what's here for each one of us to do. Doing for others makes you feel good, so you're almost depriving other people <laughs> of feeling good. And, and it's just, you don't need to do it by yourself. And the more that you allow that into your life, the, the stronger you become. The people I most respect are the ones that are very bottom line, upfront, and ask for exactly what they want. And I'm most likely to give it to them because then I don't have to try and guess, well, what does this person really want from me? But being straight is what I need. I need people just to be upfront and straight. I don't have a lawnmower, and I've gone intermittently with having a gardener come into the lawns and not, and when I don't, I just go next door. And I'm like, can I use a lawnmower? They're like, sure, you know, we just empty it, fill it up with gas, or even the same thing, the pool and the kids. I've told my neighbors, we're going on for a week, but you know, you're more than welcome to come over and swim, just make sure, you know, I, the gates open, you know, the filter's all automatic, and it's just, it is such a give and take that it just makes life seamless. And the most important thing that I learned about myself was that I wanted to make a contribution. No one had ever talked to me about that. I didn't even know that that was a gigantic, big, missing piece of my soul that I wanted to make a contribution. I started a charity to help homeless families with children and raised $1 million in three years. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. The community involvement as far as being an empowered woman is you got to step out of your house. You got to kind of take some initiative. And I think that with my personal circumstances, it would have been very easy to just kind of go about my life and stay here. But I knew that in order to move forward with things that I had to reach out to my neighbors and you have to knock on the door and, and get involved with things and ask for help. And it is just, where I had an issue for quite a while, asking for help and needing help. But the more I asked, the better I felt. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue of feeling like I've got to rely on people. It was more of I get to rely on people. So if you're in relationship with someone and they're doing something that's driving you crazy, instead of blaming them, to look and say, what is in this for me? What can I learn from this? The fact of the matter was I was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer, what was I gonna do with it? Who was I gonna tell? How was I gonna handle my life at that point, at that moment? And it took me a few days to settle into um, who was I gonna tell and find my support community. Our empowerment exists through connection, collaboration, and creation with every other being. We must work in cooperation. And if we're going to work in cooperation to make the world work, we also must approach working with each other with an attitude of embracing and allowance and acceptance. And that means embracing and allowing and accepting all faiths, all religions, all cultural practices. Just by being authentic in community, they're able to build bridges. We, as women, are able to build bridges. We're able to create relationships. We're able to find that connecting piece between people. And that's what community is all about, is connecting people to one another. I've done a lot of solo traveling around the world. I've been to Southeast Asia, New Zealand, Fiji, Australia, and a lot of times I felt pretty lonely on these trips, but I soon came to realize that there's a whole community of people surrounding me, despite their language barriers, their cultural differences. If I really needed help, these people were there to help me. I heard once that at the end of our lives, we were asked two questions. And the two questions are, how much did you grow and how much did you expand in your ability to love? Well, those two things, how much did you grow and how much did you expand in your ability to love, are really brought about through our relationships and through our community. His Holiness said uh, once that one of the most important things we could do in America was to make friends. 
Since you're in America, you don't always know who you are living right next door to. You don't even speak to the people across the street. Some studies show that when 1% of a population of an area meditates, for example, that the crime rate reduces, the accident rate reduces, the health uh, improves in the community. So we really are here to bond with each other and to collectively, if we want to change the world, to do it together as community. The community is, they're, they're my ears. They're there listening. I'm, my music is their medicine. So if I just kept it to myself, if I didn't cultivate the talent, or if I just played it alone in a room and just soothed my own uh, pains or just satisfy myself, I mean, that's one way to look at it. But in my journey, my journey has been all about the ways to share what it is that, that, I, that I do. And that's why I really support women gathering together in groups, in dream groups, um, in groups to express their emotions, and groups to express their intuitions or prophecies or seeings or knowings, uh, places where women are accepted amongst other women. And it's very important that I don't know how I could survive without my women friends. Just something very special to have a circle of women and women to have one another. It's something very, very special that you know, I think needs to be brought back in. The village fire, women getting together and talking around the village fire about what's deepest inside of them. You know, there's, there's something so magical about that and lighting of the candles and bringing the flowers around and, and seeing where it takes you. You know, it's really a source of health and well-being. In addition to the oxytocin that starts flowing through the women's bodies, which is the love hormone that naturally happens with female bonding. Incorporating the relationships and community key element begins to create a sense of ease in our lives as we become more generous and allow others to help us. That said, beginning new relationships can often trigger countless emotions in a woman's life. To be an empowered woman in relationship, she must gain emotional strength and maturity. Let's now take a look at the emotional key element. To be empowered emotionally means to just be present with your feelings. I think for a long time in our culture, we've kind of discounted feelings that seemed sissy or, or not in the spirit of true business, commerce, rationalism that has really been the Western way of culture since the Renaissance. But I think that as we're moving into the 21st century, we're recognizing that there's a relational aspect to everything we do and that relationships have value. They have value in business, they have value in commerce, they have value in academia, they have value in all sorts of areas that they were never valued before. And really women bring that relational aspect to any interaction they have and it's because they are more in touch with their emotions generally. So I think to be empowered emotionally is to just know that it's okay to understand your emotions, to feel them all. Don't be afraid of them, don't run from them, and don't be ashamed of them. So if I can let go of all of my drama, all of my mental chaos, if I can tap into that type of feeling and emotion, then I can be more of that uh, grounded person that sees actuality and sort of lets go of you know, the things that I create that I call reality. You know, my emotional health, I definitely would say, has been, I, I was never somebody that even thought about my emotional health. And then, you know, when I lost my husband, it was, it's one of those things that you just think, this doesn't happen to me, this is not my life. I mean, I even approached that with, okay, I'm gonna get through this, how do I do this? And, you know, um, found a therapist who saved my life in so many ways. Um, and was told basically, you know, I can't give you a to-do list to get through your grief. And it took a couple of years for that to sink in, honestly. There is no shame in my game. I will do whatever it takes. I will talk to whoever I need to talk to because I've been on both sides and I will never ever let myself get to a dark, deep place that, that makes you feel like the world is over. I don't want to be here anymore. And I never felt that way, but there were plenty of times where you just kind of want to sleep for a few months. And I just kind of wanted to do that. And 
sorry. <laughs> you know, even saying that, it's, it's just, it's not who I am. Ugh. But coming through that, you know, that <laughs> there's nothing that I can't get through. And I see getting through that, what it did for my kids. And not, not just being here, but letting them see. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. It's okay to hurt. And you can be sad today and you can still laugh tomorrow and it's okay, you know? And it, it's just something that as soon as I let go of what, it, what I had envisioned it, it was supposed to feel like, again, it all comes back to detaching. I totally let go of what I had preconceived notions of I'm supposed to be sad or I'm supposed to be happy or, you know, my kids were so little, my son could feel it if I was sad. You know, the kids could feel it. I had a six-year-old who was like acting like she was 15 because she was trying to do the right thing. And sometimes when you see the people in your life responding to how you're feeling, it's a kind of a wake-up call. As soon as I took ownership of just allowing myself to feel what I needed to feel, I just, I got through it. I kind of got this idea that took years to, to get to the right place, but um, that the best way to honor him was to live and to, to show these kids to live and be happy. And now I joke around with them and all their bad faults are their dads because he's not here to defend himself and he would have found that funny. So it's okay to do that. Learning to trust how I'm feeling has given me an emotional health that I, I couldn't even comprehend and to honor it, it it's just, um, it's turned my life around. To notice something different in a new way is, is the doorway that leads to transformation. I think emotional empowerment comes from not denying how you're feeling. I think that a lot of times we're trying to bury our feelings or ignore them or we don't know what they are and then they sneak up on us and kick our butts. I think we just need to figure out what they are, let them run their course, and move on. Our emotions are contagious. We catch the emotions of the people around us just like we catch people's colds. So it's really important who we surround ourselves with. They say that we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. So look at your life and see who are the five people that you associate with the most. Are they people whose emotions you want to catch? And if not, then maybe you need to make some new choices in your life. Maybe you need to limit the amount of time that you spend around people. Because what I found is that if you want to be more empowered in life, you need to be around other people who are empowered. I have this terrible habit. I cry when I get angry. And at first I was really embarrassed about this. I'd be in a business meeting with all men and I would just start crying. It was really embarrassing. What I recognize is that I was in touch with my anger and I, now I'm able to catch myself when I'm about to cry, ask myself what the anger's about and channel it into something that usually brings to the table a thing that nobody else in the room had thought about. So to be in touch with them and recognize what it is really gives women power. I'm an incredibly emotional creature and the more I allow for that feeling state to move freely through me, the more freedom I feel with what I'm feeling. Where we tend to get bogged down with our emotions is again through the storyline. I think we all carry baggage with us from all of our past relationships. And I mean, I, I know, you know, I dated the same guy eight times. He had different names, heights, hair colors, but you know, same person underneath. And it wasn't until I let go of what my issues were that I met the right person. Now that, you know, I'm past my diagnosis, I can look back and say, Oh, thank God, you know, and, and really embrace the miracle of it and really embrace the happiness of being through, you know, a challenging time. Same thing happened when I realized I was um, starting to lose my hair, you know, um, there was a big emotion around that. God bless, one of my best friends stepped in and said, let's have a ceremony. You know, your DNA is held in your hair. And um, so before my hair could fall out, we went ahead and took it and um, we shaved the, the whole thing off and had a whole ceremony about saying goodbye to my old life and welcoming in a new one. 
and, and she took me to the wig store to get a wig. And at first I was completely freaked out by the whole wig thing and allowed myself to have the emotions. And she forced me, she's like, you're going to the mall. We're going to the mall with a new wig. And I had to walk around the mall and, um, and people would stop and stare at me. And I was convinced it was because they knew it was a wig. And, and it turned out it, um, that's not it at all. Even my family didn't even figure out that I was wearing a wig, that, um, that I actually looked good in the wig and that, you know, people were stopping or saying something or whistling because I looked good, not because um, they figured out that it was a wig. And, and so the, I watched the course of my own emotions in there and I watched how my attitude switches and, and allowing myself to have the experience of loss a loss of the hair, loss of, you know, whatever it is, fear of what's everybody going to think, and then getting to the point where who cares what everybody thinks, and, you know, hey, I like this wig, you know, there are tons of advantages to this whole thing. Showers now, five minutes, in and out, bam, you know, piece of cake, just so easy now that like, you can switch it around to here are all the advantages of having a wig now that you normally, I, I would have been terrified about six months ago. So part of that's attitude, part of it's allowing myself to go through all the, the emotional cycle. When I allow myself to feel the loss, to feel the, you know, fear, whatever it is, and get to the other side of that, it's much easier than if I tried to stuff it. <sighs> if we allow ourselves to be with these emotions that come up from the challenges, I feel like a lot of us don't allow ourselves to be with the emotions and we think something's wrong with that. But if we're with them and we're feeling them and we're being with them as opposed to bearing them or hiding them, I feel like this is where the true emotional empowerment comes from. Embracing our emotions is often perceived as a weakness and yet we can see now that it is one of our greatest strengths. Accepting what we feel and not running from it or judging it as wrong or bad allows us to feel and choose to be empowered. It's now time to visit the part of us that chooses what we believe. To be empowered mentally means to be able to learn. Because once you recognize that you can learn anything, there's information at your fingertips and you can understand it. I think a lot of times women feel that for whatever reason, they're unable to learn certain things. There are topics that they aren't able to know or that they don't have access to. And I think that comes from upbringing and school systems and a lot of stuff that's changing now. But none of that is the truth. So to be empowered mentally means I can understand anything. I can look at the internet, I can go buy a book, I can ask questions, I can do whatever it takes to understand it. PMA, positive mental attitude. Um, mental health is critical. Uh, attitude is, is everything in life. You know, we live in a very mind-dominated society. We think that our thoughts are king. We've been trained that way. What I found is that people who are living from their heart, from an open heart, a heart that's full of gratitude, of care, of compassion, of forgiveness. Those are the people who truly have the most power in life. There was some research done at Harvard years ago by a man whose name is Kohlberg, a very great guy who looked at moral development and stages of moral development. And he looked at, for example, boys and girls at play. Boys like the rules. <laughs> if you've got a team and there are 10 people on the team, but you have 11 guys, well, the rule is, sorry, it ends at 10. Number 11 has to sit out. You've got a mediator who figures this out. Girls don't do it that way. They find they'll change the rules so that all 11 can play. There's a sense of inclusivity. When Carol Gilligan from Harvard revisited some of the work on Kohlberg, she said, it's not that women are inferior in moral reasoning. It's that we reason a different way. We reason with our heart because we want to find a way that everyone can be included and something wondrous can come out of that that didn't exist before.
So mental empowerment for me means I get to choose my outlook on life. I get to choose my attitude every day. It's getting rid of all the clutter in your head, not listening to all the little voices that are going, you can't do that, you know, you can't, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough or whatever, and really finding that balance of who you are. So the mind is a sneaky little thing. It actually tries to convince us that we're not responsible for us. We're not responsible for how we treat other people, for how other people treat us. And until we get that we have to be 100% responsible for us, we are never gonna be mentally empowered. Blame game, we all, come on, everybody knows that. Everybody who's watching this knows that. You internally know this. We just get caught up in the drama, right? Because we don't wanna feel. To feel that we, that we're responsible or that we, we, we created something that, that hurts is too painful to meet. So we wanna put it on someone else. But we all know internally that blaming doesn't work. Everybody knows this. You treat people like crap because there's something in you that's hurt in that same place. We always hurt others from the place where we're hurt. And so we treat people badly because we feel badly. When we feel good about ourselves and when we're totally healed, we don't have that need to make others feel bad. But when we're hurt, there's some open wound there, we spill it out all over everyone else. Everyone does it. I think being mentally empowered means knowing the difference between the voices in your head and the voices in your heart. Your head is great for things like doing your taxes and your budget and putting more crap in your suitcase. Your head's not so great for things like, should I stay in this relationship? Should I quit my job? Should I follow my heart? Because your head's gonna make up reasons why you should be scared and reasons why you should keep doing what you've been doing because you know it. And really, you need to keep the mind in check. Once we are aware that we choose what we believe, we begin to become incredibly empowered by harnessing the psychological key element. Now that we are enjoying a healthy mind, you can't forget the body. Let's take a look at the physical well-being key element. To be empowered physically means to find that which makes your body sing when you do it. Whether it's hiking or yoga or any sort of fun movement, to feel like you have to do something, to feel like there's some external force telling you you have to do something to be healthy, that doesn't feel like you're empowered physically. It feels like you're living up to some external standard. I feel the same way about food. Eat what you want, eat it in moderation, and don't do what the supposed experts tell you to do. Just listen to your own body and you'll be fine. Again, in terms of how it affects my health, the reason I said about the whole is because I truly believe that the parts can't be well without the whole being well and vice versa. And a whole involves our physical, mental, spiritual and emotional bodies. So I think to have a wholeness in every area, I have a driving need inside me to try to be whole in those areas. And, and I try to learn all the time. Physical empowerment to me means taking care of your body. For my body, I am physically empowered because it's fit, it's in shape, and I'm expressing love for my body as I take care of it. Physical activity plays such a big role in my life. It is so important to me because it allows me to nourish my body. It allows me to nourish my mind because exercise is a time of meditation and me time. And overall, it feeds my passion for taking care of my whole self. I think being physically empowered is knowing that it's a relationship. Like any other relationship, it's about communication. When I'm not in communication with my body, I worry about things like how it looks or what people think of it or whether I should be eating or whether I should be exercising or what I should be doing. When I'm in communication with my body, I know what's going on and I get to enjoy it. From time of diagnosis to all clear was six months. And for most people who are diagnosed at stage four ovarian cancer, that's, that's not generally the case. There was no tomorrow. All of a sudden you're fighting for your life and you know, one of the top things, first things that I did was take a look at what I was eating, what nutritional supplements I was going to need, you know, what did I need on the physical front? What did I need to do? So I came at it from physical, mental, emotional, um, spiritual, um, all of these angles, all of those avenues I came at you know, this diagnosis. Because as soon as you use the two C words, cancer or chemo, everyone's got all their reactions. But it was really important to me to just keep the container of people who could see me healthy, whole, 
quickly. And I was very, very blessed. The people who I chose to tell, um, told the story to, were great. They were just so great. And I can't believe I'm crying. I've never cried telling this story. Um, they were great. And, and they held me in that space that made it so easy for me to get through this um, in ways that, you know, you hear horror stories about chemo and um, the way I chose to go about this, you know, chemo was the easiest part of it. Um, dealing with recovering from surgery was far harder than dealing with chemo. And so now that I've had the all clear and I'm fine, I'm staying with my physical health so to maintain that. And, um, and, and physical health is um, a, a much higher priority for me now. Loving your body and challenging it to be everything it can be is a wonderful experience. When harnessed, your body is a powerful vehicle and instrument to use in this amazing human game. With a healthy mind and a healthy body, you are now ready to take a leap into the key element of spirituality and wisdom. You know, being empowered spiritually to me means recognizing that there's always guidance within us. Whatever that means to you, whether you call it God or intuition or whatever word anyone uses, there is a source within us that is always with us. And being empowered spiritually means being connected to that, to rely on that power, to ask it for guidance, to listen to the guidance that it gives. Sometimes that's the hard part, but to know that it's always there and that it's always conspiring for our good. It's always moving us to some higher level, always wanting the best for us. So once we learn to trust that, and connect to it, then any decision is easy. Any course of action can be outlined for us because we know that that inner guidance is always there and it's always helping us. I think that's the very best part, is to be empowered spiritually, to be connected, to feel like you are really connected to that higher power. I'm so aware that the greatest gifts of my life, the discovery of a spiritual truth about who I am, and then deciding to really pursue a spiritual path of education and ultimately ministry came from the greatest challenges that I had. It's doing what God wanted me to do, what I feel God wanted me to do. And it's allowing um, my ego to stay aside when I'm speaking and uh, to be of service to the people in the room, which makes me sound like Mother Teresa and I'm really not Mother Teresa. But I do pray before I go on stage and I do pray to give these people what they need or to have stuff for these people come through me or into the room or somebody else be there to help. I love what Byron Katie says. Byron Katie says that God is good, God is everything and there are no mistakes in the universe. And therefore, if we're not seeing the world as this incredible experience, right? Then it's only, or, or as perfect, let's say perfect, um, then it's only the mind that needs to shift. I believe we should honor all religions. I believe that we should honor all faiths and all spiritual practices. You know, I believe that the inherent nature of life is good and that all potential is available for us. The truth is always uh, inherent in all of the sacred texts. What I do know and what I do feel is that I am a drop from the ocean, yet within the drop is everything that's within the ocean. So I feel connected to that, I feel that within me. And the more I allow myself to feel it, the more I become a part of it. The more I become a part of it, the more I realize that I was never separate from it. You know, we're here to do our inner homework, right? So that, so that we can finally come to that place where we're transparent and realize that there is no you. There is no me, there, there, there is not that, there is no separation, there's only unity. I think it's really powerful, I'm calling this the grand reprioritization, because we're being forced to look at the paradigms that don't work any longer. It doesn't work any longer to put our sense of security into the world of the materialistic realm. And we're being forced to really analyze what is true. A true master is really saturated in the experience and the knowledge that every single moment is here as a gift to each and every one of us. And so no matter what happens, there's this grace that follows in the way that they respond to that. 
I get out of my own way and I recognize that this power that is within me does all the work. And so I am able to accomplish things that I never thought would be possible if it was just my human self doing all this action and trying to bang around and, and make things happen. But when I just kind of let go and surrender and allow that power that is already in me to work through me, miracles happen. Lives are transformed, including my own. And when we can focus on our similarities rather than our differences, I think that's where the answer is. And that exchange, as subtle as it, or insignificant as it may be, on an individual basis, when you are confronted with someone of a different faith who wants to challenge your faith, how we respond is a micro is kind of a microcosm of the macrocosm. It's how the globe, how the people of the world must also respond. Emerson said, "Half past the evolutionary clock, there is no turning back," and I really believe that we have moved half past that evolutionary clock. And it's an exciting time. There's, there is no other time. Our souls, we were born right here, right now, for this time. We agreed on some level, on a soul level before we came in, we knew that we were gonna be here now when all of this was poised on the precipice, I believe a great conscious change. We are all these perfected beings and that we are, we are spirit and we are having a physical experience and that as human beings, we are here to, to play and experience and and, and that's basically it, and that we get bogged down in these storylines and that in order to release the weight of that, we can begin very simply by asking, how can I let go? For some people, they believe that, you know, God doesn't give them more than they can handle, and I believe that. And at the same time, I also believe that I had to say so in my life before I got here. So in the perfect design of things, there was somewhere that I had agreed to get this diagnosis, I agreed to get cancer, and so I had to take a look at, all right, if I got myself into this, then I can get myself out. So the spiritual connection about money has a lot to do with understanding that there's an infinite source of all supply, that it flows through many different channels, which include the job and the lover and the investments and the hit records and all the things that we somehow think give us money, those are actually channels through which the source flows. I am a spiritual being using this body as my time on earth. Because you can't kill energy. How do you kill energy? Energy doesn't die. My body will leave, but me as energy will always be here. Something beyond is working through me for the benefit of others. And in that spirit, I want to the best of my ability to bring out that empowerment in other people. And when we have a relationship to that spiritual source that is vibrant, and we feel that the divine is our provider, and that we're one with something greater, what that does is it reduces fear and stress, and it creates a foundation of peace for women. And when a woman is peaceful, and grateful, and satisfied, and content with the money situation that she has, she's often able to access creativity and possibility for what she wants to create. My daughter, uh, Christy, was killed in a car accident um, seven years ago. She was and is my spark. Uh, she was, I think, my best friend. After she died, uh, uh, I was at a compassionate friends meeting for parents who have lost children, and a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, your daughter was standing behind you all night long and she's a beautiful girl. It was part of the bigger plan, and I can see that when I step back and look from a distance. In the, when you're in, the sp in that space, it's still hard, and it's still hard for me now. But I can, um, I can see the big picture, too. You know, I can see the hand of God when I look back on my life. I know this is exactly my path. And Christy was a big part of that, and she's still with me. And I am so grateful for her. I miss her, but um, it was meant to be. All the key elements we've shared are necessary for each of us to live an empowered life. And at the same time, we are all unique and have key elements that are specifically important to us. We each need to uncover and embrace these elements. Let's visit your unique key elements. Within each of us, we have unique keys that help us unlock our own personal empowerment. 
One of my greatest values is to be learning, because if I'm not learning, I, I just, something in me doesn't feel right. There are some key elements to me personally about staying empowered, and a huge one is nature. I've grown up in the Rocky Mountains my whole life. When I'm starting to feel disconnected or stressed, I just have to get into nature, and sometimes it means going up to the mountains to go hiking. Sometimes it's as simple as planting flowers in my backyard, but it's getting my hands in the dirt and reconnecting with nature. That's definitely a key element. I grew up in a very interesting time. I lived in the Boston area, and there was a young Harvard professor whose name was Ram Dass. And I went to a lecture that he gave that forever changed my idea about taking responsibility versus blaming others. And he said frequently when we blame others, what we're doing is we're projecting our own fears about our own insufficiency outward onto someone else. And he said it's a great practice whenever you're ready to blame someone else to just stop for a minute, take a breath, and say, and I am that too. If I was to notice this differently, how would I change? How would I feel differently about this? So that you become incredibly responsible in a way that is lifting and exhilarating, as in I'm able to respond to my reality, I'm able to respond to my experience rather than I'm a victim of my experience, I'm a victim of my life, and all of these experiences that are coming at me are weighing me down. I think the number one key to being empowered in life is to taking full responsibility for what happens. Not necessarily that you created everything that happened, but that you create your response to everything that happened. Courage is nothing other than just taking that thing that you're afraid of and doing it, just doing it full, you know, just going for it. So if you want to build courage, just, just find something that you're really afraid to do and then just do it. Because every time you do something that, that causes you great fear, after you do it and you realize you didn't die, you're that much more courageous. So you just keep doing those things. So make a list of all the things you're afraid to do and just start tackling one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And what you'll find after a while is that you're not afraid anymore. It's like if you're afraid to do public speaking, right? A lot of public speakers, I myself would freeze in front of a camera. But I just, but I love, my love to, to speak was so great that I just said, no, do it. And the more I did it, the more I found that I, each time I, I wasn't afraid. I was less and less afraid. Now people think I have great courage because I, I can do almost anything on stage. I'm not afraid at all. What all of the wisdom traditions tell us is that happiness comes from within us. It's not associated with things outside of us. And, you know, it's what, what modern social sciences will tell you is that as long as you have enough to eat, and shelter over your head, material things add very little to happiness. You do have to have certain basics, however. What does add to that happiness is one's capacity to be present in the moment, to be appreciative, to be grateful, to open your heart to other people. Most people spend their lives trying to find all the good reasons gather all the good circumstances and things in their life to be happy. And I call that happy for good reason. The problem with that is that when you're happy for good reason, you could lose any of those things. And also you're depending upon something outside that you may not be able to control in order to be happy. What I found is that true happiness is what I call happy for no reason. And that's when you have an inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on your circumstances. So your life may not be perfect, but you're happy anyway. One of the greatest ways to learn how to be a good manager and a su successful person is to have children and to have a house to manage and to have a business to run. I've never had children, unfortunately, much as I would have loved them, and I borrowed this one from the producer of the show. But I think women who have children are extraordinary uh, creatures. The way they juggle looking after the children and jobs and families and relationships and very often they're single mums these days so a lot has to happen no! with with juggling kids and work just as we're doing in this particular interview and all the research is showing that even if you have a very supportive husband then 
the woman still does more of the social activities, the child rearing, the planning, the shopping. How all of that helps you to learn how to hire people in business, run your business, understand how to delegate, and what is really important, how to set your priorities. So I would say hiring a woman with children is a great thing to do because she's going to be your sharpest employee. An important element of being empowered is gratitude. You know, I belong to a spiritual tradition that believes that what we focus on expands, what we put our attention on expands. And so if we look around and find things to be grateful for and we look for the good in our lives and praise it, then we're just asking the universe to bring us more good. It's a way to just make sure that we're always looking at the things that are working instead of focusing on the things that are not working. So gratitude is crucial. I keep a gratitude journal. Every night I sit down and make a list and really get to the feeling place of it. Make a list of all the things I'm grateful for that happened that day. Some days are easier than others, but every day I find at least 10 things that I'm grateful for. And I've just seen my life expand in amazing ways since I started that practice. Whenever you're in gratitude, you're in receptivity. That's why gratitude is such a beautiful practice. It's actually a practice for empowerment is to open up to feeling grateful because then you receive the blessings of the world. You fill yourself up and you're more able then to give from a place of fullness. I feel that I have been given so much as a first worlder, as someone who received a fabulous education, as someone who's basically healthy and not bad looking. I've been given so much and there's a natural overflow from that, which is that I want to extend to other people and gift them with what's flowing over from my life. And I think that's really the root of service. I think another key element for me is also fun. And for me, fun is defined as being with people. I love being around people. I am an extrovert. I like talking to friends, uh, acquaintances, family members. I love going to parties. So I know that when I start to feel disconnected, I have to schedule something social on my calendar. If I start to feel like I'm not empowered, physically or mentally or emotionally, talking to someone else generally kind of boosts me back up and helps shore up my resolve to move forward in whatever area I'm feeling a little weak in. Discovering your key elements and incorporating them into your life will guide you to a world full of empowerment. However, until you are willing to accept the core element, none of the other elements will truly serve you. The only way to be truly alive and to be truly empowered and to be truly healthy in all aspects of your being is to be acting from that thing that is always calling you, to be coming from that place of inspiration and doing that thing that is uniquely yours to do and to just reconnect with it every day and go for it. Feeling that feeling of being inspired. In fact, within the word inspiration, you can find the letters for three other words not in any order, but the letters for three other words. The words are spirit, rational, and lion. Leading a life of inspiration. In order to lead a life of inspiration, I've got to tap into that one component that's very much actuality, and that is that feeling of spirit or that sense of purpose. I also have to be rational, yes, it's not an illusion to tap into the power of my mind and be rational. I can prepare mentally, so if it goes down, it doesn't take me emotionally down with it. And it's also not an illusion to be bold like a lion. I can be humble on the inside and bold on the outside. I can pursue my dreams and goals, not just my dreams and goals to have things, but my dream and goals to be more my dream and goals to do more, my dream and goals to give more. A deal I made with myself is that I will honor, trust, honor, and listen to my intuition, no matter what that may be. So that's me being integrity with myself. You know, we were talking earlier about inspired action and trusting yourself. When you do that, it flows effortlessly. The very next day, I got this thought to call Deepak Chopra. And I had called his office a couple of years before and it was uh, kind of like, well, who the hell are you? You know, I was just new in this business and nobody knew me. I didn't have a, any kind of a reputation or anything. I thought, I'm going to call him about coming to Fort Collins in the fall of 2009. 
And when I called, she actually knew my name. She recognized me. And she was very open and um, we had a nice conversation. She said, but we're not scheduling that far out yet, but let's stay in touch. And she was sincere. And in the course of the conversation, I had told her about, I was moving into Seattle and doing a series there. But we hang up and she calls me back three days later and she said, I bet you didn't expect to hear from me this soon. And she said, Deepak's doing a book tour after the first of the year, and we've never had any luck connecting with a good promoter in the Seattle market. And would you be interested in having him as part of your series? So I said, so uh, when is Deepak going to be in Seattle? And she said, March 4th. Well, March 4th was my date at the hall. I mean, it, if she would have said almost any other date, it wouldn't have worked. I go into Seattle for the very first time with this series, and I have Deepak Chopra in the lineup. It just came together perfectly. And I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> In order for it to be sustainable, it has to come from us and it has to come from within because everything in this external world or what we perceive to be the external world is fleeting and is temporary and the most lasting thing is the least tangible thing and it is that that we need to connect with. Well for women's empowerment it's really essential for women to get in touch with their intuition and that's beyond their mind. It's in addition to their mind. It's getting in touch with what's in the gut, the voice inside. It's part of the nature for um, the women to get in touch with this and for a woman to live a life in the material world apart from their intuition, it's very hard. Because I made the agreement with myself to start trusting, acting, and listening on my intuition. So I placed the ad, local author looking for a house to rent. Within four days, I received four calls. And the fourth call, the people said, we're not on the lake, but would you be willing to come look at our house? And I said, sure. And as I was pulling up, I heard a voice, this is your new home. So I entered the house and they said to me, do you want to buy our house? And I said, it depends on how much you want for it. So the next day they called me and it was a price I agreed that I said they would buy it, they would offer it to me. So I bought the house on a handshake actually. There was no agents involved. I closed the deal, I think it was within a week. I love living my life that way. Trust your gut. I mean, the absolute best advice I have for anybody in business, male or female, is learn to hear your inner voice and learn to trust your instincts because that's where you'll get all the best information. If you're sitting in a meeting with somebody and your stomach starts to turn, that is the biggest red flag you can get. We teach people how to align with their passion all over the world. And your, your, your passions don't come from your mind, they come from your heart, right? And it's, and it's so interesting to me because you'd think it would be so easy for people to know what they're passionate about. The thing that gets in the way is their, is their brain. You know, they start going into their head and, and ask, and you know, instead of just dropping into, do I love this? Do I love this? Would it be fun? Does it fill me with joy? It's, can I do it? How's it gonna happen? Am I capable? Do I have all the right attributes? And it's so interesting because there's this Harris Poll survey that found that 80% of working Americans wake up every morning not happy, not fulfilled, and not passionate about what they do. Quit your job if you don't like it. Go find something you love. That's what life's about. And these 80 percenters, I am positive, when they were young, they had a dream just like everyone. You know, just like the 20 percenters that are living their dream. And yet, someone probably came along and said, who do you think you are? You know, you're not beautiful, you're not smart enough, you don't have what it takes. And then, those 80 percenters bought into that. But they bought into it. Anyone can say what they say, it's just what is your mind going to do with it? I see this all the time that, that we seem to let our mind trick us into, into taking us farther away from what it is that is the most important thing to us. So many people do that. Be and it's just due to fear. Fear of just stopping, dropping in, being clean, and listening, and then moving forward. Because there's that great fear of, what if I fail? 
I had the experience of cancer. And while I was going through that, I did a lot of research on people who survived cancer. And what I found is that people who survive cancer are people who find that thing in their lives that they love, that they are passionate about. And they're able to change their lives so that that becomes their life's work. The people who don't do as well on the survival rates are the people who just keep going to the job they don't care about, they stay in the marriage that isn't fulfilling, they just keep doing the roles that they think society has prescribed for them but that they don't really feel any passion for. This weird thing that I came up with, you know, to do what I love and when I'm not loving it anymore, take a break and do something else, I get to do what I want in life. I always tell people don't think small. You know, if you're going to do something, you might as well go all out and do it big and follow that passion all the way to the end, even when it gets scary. So I quit my day job and I thought, you know, what have I got to lose? I've already lost my daughter. Um, it's just a house. If I lose my house, it's just a house. I can't lose anymore. Just go for it. That's what I always tell people, you know, when they ask my opinion. It's like, go for it and think big and move forward and let go of your fears. I don't know where my stuff comes from, but it comes in. It comes from a higher power and it just comes in and I know when it's right. So there's lots of different names for it. I call it intuition. And when I'm living my life from a place of intuition, this is where I'm happiest. This is where my life just flows. If I'm not living from intuition, life isn't so easy. As a photographer, I really just need to know how to hold a camera. I don't worry about how the photos get taken because they take themselves. There's some kind of magic or passion or whatever you want to call it that takes the photos and I don't need to understand it. I don't need to know what it is. I just need to let it happen. When I resist it, when I try to worry about how I'm gonna get that shot, it never works. It's only when I don't worry about it and trust that it's just gonna happen that it happens. And that's pretty much how life is. When you're choosing in favor of what you're most passionate about, there is no work, you're always in play. What do you choose? Am I doing my part? Am I taking action? And if I can tap into that, then yes, I can, I can create, I can, I can attract with more ease. I'm going with the flow, and I can attract more when I am going in the flow, and that flow is the divine flow of my life. So now you can clearly see how to truly live an empowered life by incorporating the key elements your unique key elements and the core element, you now have the roadmap. It's no longer a journey you need to take alone. If one of us is left behind, we are all left behind. There are countless women around you, friends, colleagues, the women currently sitting next to you. Talk to them, support each other in all areas of your life. It's only when we join together and have the important conversations in community and incorporate them into our personal lives that we become empowered women. The opportunity is now. Are you ready to accelerate your journey? Are you ready to live an empowered life? We see sell, rich, <laughs> Bahamas. <laughs> well, do you want to lecture on the history of quantum mechanics and how rationalism and uh, the doctrine of mentality has actually hurt the, uh, the globe and now how women bringing their emotional intelligence to it is going to help? Or do you want me to just answer the question? Okay, next question. <laughs> yeah. You sure? You have problems making decisions? Mm, let me think. <laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> you gotta quit doing that. <laughs> I just want to 
swear to God, I feel like I'm gonna break my wrist. I don't know how he does it. Ashe, <laughs> Shante. Who are you talking about? I'm talking about you. I'm making fun of you because it's sad. <laughs> no, I am crying. Okay. So back to have I struggled as a hoops. Bruce, can you try to be quiet for just one minute? One minute left. Let a man answer this last question. We'll be done. I know you're making her have a female quietly. Yeah, I'm gonna go. This really is perfect for me. Like I am so getting what women, women go through. It's mostly single women, right? What they go through to uh, to be successful in business. You have youth on your side. I do have youth. I do have youth. On, youth. On. Yeah, you do have that thing. I do have youth on my side. I think that in order to be truly spiritually empowered, we need to be embracing our differences that we have. <laughs> so I got through this phase of my life very quickly, and I need a tissue. <laughs> Wasn't planning and crying. What a pretty little girl you are. Um, okay, so I was rabbiting on about my mother and oh. oh Once we are aware that we choose what we believe, we begin to become incredibly powerful and empowered and something else. <laughs> it's always play and it's always fun. When you're loot, when you're, oh shoot, darn it. Whoa, okay. If you can talk fast because the wind holds. I, I could do that. <laughs> is when you are so aligned internally that there is a, a big trust. A big truck that comes behind because you actually didn't like that answer, so you wanted to start anyway fresh. So you manifested a truck. Just be no. quiet. Do you want to sit next to me? Do you want to come sit next to Amanda? Well, just sit on the edge of the seat here. Stand next to me. All those other good things, and I just totally got lost somewhere, but that's okay. And sometimes, if I'm sharing from my emotions, it feels like, well, you know, she's on her period, or, you know, or she ain't on her period, she's on her menopause. <laughs> or she's on both of it in the full moon. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you want, you want to be done? You want to? No, I'm having fun, it's okay. Okay. I totally did not know I was gonna start crying, sorry. <laughs> that okay? <laughs> that, was, that was horrible. <laughs> horrible. Now I'm concerned about this hair um, getting my mouth a lot, but we'll see how bad that looks. It's not bad, okay. What I do want to say is that an important. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, then you're gonna make me cry. Okay, drill this down. Just to make sure I don't fall off. I feel five percent better. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say? I love what you guys are doing. I give a huge thumbs up to the Empower Project. I am thrilled to be a part of it. These guys are fabulous. Their hearts and minds are in the right places.